Hey, am I in here? Oh, let me see. One second. Hmm. Can you guys hear me? Let's see. Let's see. It should be good. It's okay. All right. <laughs> I'm always paranoid. I think it's because I start talking on Zoom and then they're like, you need to stop muting your mic. Uh, did you guys see that video? Like, I don't know if it actually played. I played it, but I'm not sure if you guys saw it. But yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, so the L wife will be joining us pretty quickly here. She just has to eat dinner. And I told her that would be okay with me. And um, so we are going to talk. I'm going to say hi really quick. Hi, Jennifer. Kathy, thank you so much for being here. Hi, Tina. Um, Katie H. And let's see. Oh, Mormon No More. Yeah, that was really interesting to watch. That was really interesting. I thought it, I thought it was pretty pretty decent. We actually took notes because we were going to do a live about it and kind of go through it and um, kind of figure out or try and talk about it from our perspective. Um, yeah. And yes, things are secretive. Hi, Amber E. Did I miss anyone? Donna Donald is here. Um, my, hi, Paula. Um, Tom Van, Harley, 62, Julie, hi, Steven Stevens, Pamela, Chris, and Sister Daka, what am I, hi, Jenny, BF, Lil Brands, and Artie Johnson, I think I got everyone, oh, Ramona, Tisha, or Tisha, Wise Old Lady, Hazel, Linda, hi, and Kathleen, hi. Hi, Krisha. Difficult research, Miss Peaches. Well, there's a lot of you that were on time. <laughs> Barbara Riley, I may have missed someone up there. 66 is Lister. Um, language of horses, hi. Carolyn, um, just justice. Someone like popped up and it said justice, justice Janney. Okay. I think I got everyone. Oh, Marjorie, hi. Okay. So uh, in our live uh, last Saturday, Saturday, it was Saturday, right? Uh, we we got into a conversation towards the end about Tylee and Lori and the dynamics and just some thoughts that I had. And I wanted to talk to him or talk to him. Yeah, I want to talk to Lori <laughs> right before that. But um, so I wanted to talk about it. It's actually... It was a file that I had ready to go. Well, not ready to go, but it was a topic I was planning on covering because I think it's actually like a serious issue uh, in the church that should be addressed. And I'm not saying it contributed to anything here. I think we all know that. We all know who is responsible um, for these murders. But part of what this channel is about is just explaining the beliefs behind these crimes and you know just that context that doesn't mean sorry i have to itch my cleavage <laughs> doesn't mean anything except it's helping us understand these beliefs and everything so uh but this is something that uh, i think a lot of people even active members why am i so short okay um would say is an issue I definitely think you can recognize it in Lori and how she was raised. And then I think she was trying to raise Tylee the same way. And for some reason, that's just always struck me as just, I, I don't know how you guys felt, but just the interactions and stuff. Like I, I felt like at times it was like, she was really proud of Tylee as far as like academically, but then 
you know, she, she was definitely not supportive of her in other ways. And part of the inspiration for this video is actually a picture and difficult research has, has it too. I think not a lot of people have it. Um, Breaking crime with big E um, sent me a copy and I had actually uh, planned on using it in that video. It's nowhere to be found, of course, but in Tylee's room of the crime scene pictures, there is a whiteboard and on that whiteboard in I'm assuming Tylee's handwriting, it says water only, uh, no, sh no sweets. Uh, I can't, it says something else, but it's clear that she was trying to lose weight or she was on some sort of diet and, um, which is, which was really sad to see. It was really sad to see that, you know, because she had like exclamation points and, and it was obviously looking at that. I thought it must've been a real struggle for her to be the daughter of someone that like Kresha has talked about is just always move, always working out, always moving, always this, always that. Um, and then if you look at kind of how Lori's mom, Janice, is and the impression I get, I don't know her, but there's an impression I get that she also had very high expectations for Lori and, well, at least Lori, in one of the interviews, it's an interview way before they found their kids, when is just missing and they were trash talking Charles because they're like total bitches. But at one point in that interview, Summer says, oh, we weren't invited to Lori's weddings. And Janice corrects her and says, oh, we were invited. We just didn't go. And I was like, jeez, like, hey, yeah. And I wonder why she freaking, you know, of course you're not, most people don't turn out to be murderers, but as far as like her personality and having to be the center of attention and all of these um, behaviors that we see in these talks that she gave and in these conversations that we've heard points to someone who was just had to be the center of attention, had to be important, had to be right there. And, and that is a, in my opinion, based on what I grew up with, that's a common thread in Mormonism. And I've said before, I don't know a single Mormon woman who is happy with herself completely. There is always something that they have to do, or you know, they're not good enough for this reason, and they're not good enough for that reason. And it's just something, even now, I feel like I have a little of that left in me as far as like, wanting to meet expectations and wanting to be perfect, the whole perfectionist thing. And uh, yeah, so anyway, I'm going to share. Okay, so here's how we're going to word it. I was on the church website. Normally, I don't go on there, but I wanted to look at what the current uh, current attitude is because it's relaxed a little from when I was in Young Women's and from when Lori would have been in Young Women's. Um, and that's part of this whole, um, perspective that I have is that I grew up, I wasn't, I was about 10, 10 years younger, close to 10 years younger. So she was a teenager under president Benson and I was a scared ass kid because he was kind of scary in my opinion. So I kind of know more of like the culture that Lori would have grown up in and the church that she grew up in compared to the church that now people are growing up in because it's totally different. I mean, it's like it's weird because, you know, I wonder if that's why they don't want people quoting from the website because it's it's got a hard time keeping up with that doctrine that's ever evolving. And really, I feel like that's pretty obvious if you go on there and actually keep track. Like it says um, intellectual reserve is the agency that administers the copyright or whatever. And I think it says like, do not, you cannot copy or you can't recite or take the material, some, something like that. But it's, 
it's more extreme than what you normally see with the copyright. It's pretty much like you can say anything because we know we're going to probably change it next week. So the way we're going to do this, I want to go over kind of what is expected because there are several expectations. Some of them are very common, um, which include recruiting or spreading the gospel, whichever term you prefer, uh, and striving towards the blessings of exaltation and e eternal family and all of that. So we'll see that kind of trend. And then we'll kind of talk about it from there. But I wanted to show you all of the expectations that you really are supposed to follow. And I realized that other Christian religions that are more and even like more fundamental, I don't really know exactly how it works because, you know, Mormonism is so separate. You know, it's like Mormonism is kind of more like Catholicism. But then when it's like general Christianity, I don't really know how you define that, you know, Baptist versus that but we have like girl defined and all those bullshit people like morgan and and what's his name that also like ascribe to these and some of them are not terrible some of them are common sense and actually kind of healthy in some ways it's just the way that they're administered and the way that people interpret them and how they're thought of in mormon culture which is not in my opinion a healthy perspective on these things for many that doesn't mean it's like that across the board. I've talked before about Mormons that grow up outside the Mormon door versus Mormons that grow up in the Mormon door. And if you're not familiar with that term, I think it may have been coined by Jordan McKay. They may not have coined it, but they are ex-Mormons and they have a channel that's pretty cool. But it, it's Idaho, Utah, and Arizona which is where a lot of Mormons are concentrated. And actually, I think like Anaheim, I think there's areas of California where there's a lot of Mormons. But like if you grow up back east, you're not going to have the same experience that you're going to have in Utah or Idaho. So anyway, just keep that in mind. But also keep in mind, like these are actual guidelines and expectations and standards that everyone is expected to live up to. So we're going to, I'm just going to happen to read. And then if my screen happens to show what I'm reading, I don't really know how to control that. So uh, let's begin. So I pulled expectations for the family. I pulled expectations for women, expectations for young women, which would have been tiny. Young women are considered the age of 12 to the age of 18 before they go into Relief Society. And then I did add a little, some expectations for men. There, there are some for like teen males too, technically. But when I was growing up, it was pretty much, we call them the Scouts because the Mormon church in Utah, I don't know how it is in other states, but they pretty much co-opted the Boy Scouts. And so they weren't like, Technically, they were young men, but they were, it was scouts. Like, girls had young women's and boys had scouts. And they were working toward, like, Arrow of Light and all that stuff. And basically, they were running around being little dicks all the time and playing basketball. I really don't know at what point they ever learned anything, if they ever studied any of the gospel. But, um, Gail, that's interesting because it does say 12 on the website, I was on it today. I did notice that they now allow 14 year olds to be ministering sisters under like a relief society. Almost. It seems almost as if a relief society member would be like a mentor, but if you're 14 and they think you're mature enough and you desire it, which a lot of 14 year olds would because it's service and, there's a lot to be said about service in the church. It's very service focused that they um, they can do that. And I think that's kind of funny because it's like, okay, like what age? Like, do you go and you minister to a 30 year old? Because I might be like a little bit. I don't I don't know if I want to hear it from a 14 year old, but 
maybe other people do. I like teenagers. I actually like teenagers more so than kids, actually, like younger kids. I think teenagers are pretty cool, but I thought that was a little strange. And I have heard, hi, Renee, um, and San Willow, and everyone who's come in. I don't know, Michelle Clifford, if you came in later or earlier. Um, but yeah, so there is, uh, you'll see the common themes. We'll talk about it. And you'll know, like, it'll repeat over and over. And you're going to be like, this is why things are the way they are. Like, it'll make sense. Uh, and you'll be able to see, like, I want you to look at it. And I want you to think about the way that Lori would have interpreted it and that Melanie Gibb would have interpreted it. Because there are very specific lines that I'll try and find and point out that I think contributed to the, their interpretations and that they were positions or beliefs that they held. So it'll just, I think it'll show you kind of how things can get out of hand and not necessarily out of hand to the point of murder, but out of hand to the point of this extremist culture that has emerged. And I don't even know if it would, if I would say it's emerged, I would say that it's no longer hidden because internet and stuff and um, extremists don't seem to be super shy about sharing their disgusting attitudes towards women and gays and people of color. So let me see if this works. Um, I don't know if it will or not, but I'm going to try it. I got it to work really well one night and I don't remember exactly what I did, but let's see if, mm -hmm. okay. I think I'm just going to have to do it so I can't see you guys, which really bothers me, but. <laughs> okay let's see if this works i don't know does that work like tell me if that comes out like when i pulled that up did that did that like fill the screen i don't know if it did maybe it didn't i don't know why it worked last time Maybe. Mm, okay. When is it again? I don't know why it's. Ellie, come here. Oh, you know what? I think I know. Hold on one second. Maybe not. Oh, no. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, go. There you go. I don't know what it's doing. It came up before and then it's not coming up. Okay. Okay. Let's see. I don't know why it's doing this. Okay. I'm going to assume that everything is okay. Nobody can text me and tell me it's not. So, <laughs> um, tell me if that works. Oh, I should just have L wife get on her phone and tell me. But she went upstairs. Okay. So this is like starting with the family. And so it goes into the role of the family and God's plan. So these are the expectations as parents that they have, that the church has for family. And it just talks about ordained of God. Like we're all spirits. Yay. And then it goes into... I hate this view. It always defaults to this view. I don't know why. Okay. Um, and then it talks about eternal marriage and blessings of an eternal family. And this is something that is repeated over and over. It seems like every time they start talking about what's required, it's like, oh, but you'll 
you'll receive blessings, you'll receive blessings. So uh, each person fulfills a number of roles in an eternal family, which is kind of funny because I'm like, do you mean like sister wife? Because that's eternity kind of. Um, and then, uh, you can see like, who, okay. One of the requirements for obtaining eternal life is for a man and woman to enter the covenant of celestial marriage. What's funny about this is that it's doctrine and covenant section 131, but just a few verses down is Doctrine and Covenants 132, which talks about the everlasting covenant, a.k.a. polygamy. And that polygamy is the only way to get to the celestial kingdom. But again, Utah needed statehood. And so they were like, we're going to take a mulligan on that one. So what this is saying basically is like if you keep your if your marriage is faithful, you'll um, endure forever, I guess. Um, oh, and this is like commanding husbands and wives to cleave to each other and uh, the importance of sexually, sexual purity before marriage and um, faith, with, faithful within a marriage helps individuals be truly happy and avoid spiritual, emotional and physical harm. So I guess if you have relations before marriage, you can't ever be truly happy. And then this talks about below, like parents and children, they can receive immortality and eternal life, but they're here to get a body. That's exactly what Lori said, only she said she was just here to get a body, and I didn't hear that. But it is true, you are told that you're here to get a body, and that is the main purpose of earth life. You're here to get a body, learn lessons. But overall, this life, earth life, is not that big of a deal in the scheme of things because we have eternity. So this is just kind of like a trial, like a test, is the way it was always explained to me. So, um, and then this talks about like being parents and all these responsibilities of parents. So prepare to receive the blessings of eternal life. So you, So what a lot of people... I think it's a little different now, but if even just a few years back, it was stressed. Basically, if your children did not end up uh, being faithful members of the church too, that that was your bad. Like you were responsible for your children obtaining eternal life too and becoming a celestial family or a forever family. And so a lot of people, including like, uh, in my family, when kids left the church or whatever, it was pretty devastating to the parents, actually. And this is something you see with the LGBT plus community because they say they're accepting, but they're really not. That you see these kids basically kicked out and their families devastated because they know, according to their religion, that their child can never partake of eternal life celestial kingdom and that their forever family is forever broken because of that gay kid. So this just talks about how you're supposed to teach them to love and serve God and others. And then, you know, study the word of God, understand the doctrine, repentance, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost, which is something you receive when you're eight years old. I don't want to say it's your conscience because it's more than that. But for like right now, I'll just say it's it's similar to that. It really is kind of a mouthpiece of God. So if you are um, listening to the Holy Ghost, you're listening to God and that. So great. And I don't know how this is working. This is like so effed up and I can't figure out how I did it last time. And it worked last time. So, <laughs> wait, this is fucking weird. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually going to pull it back down because I feel like I'm doing a lecture and it's weird. And then I can't see um, what people are saying or like see the comments. And so I can't answer them. 
So like, I'm just gonna go back a little bit. Oh, five years. Okay, so now one of the responsibilities that parents have is that um, they are, again, to help their children prepare, prepare to receive the blessings of eternal life um, and all of that. We went through that. Now, here is where it gets a little sexist, even though people will argue with me on this. Um, fathers are to preside over their families. And we'll go into this uh, more when we talk about the priesthood and the responsibilities that men have, or as I like to call them, the privileges. But sorry, I'm taking Advil. <laughs> My head is killing me. Um, but uh, thankfully, if there is no father in the home, the mother can preside over the family. So that's that's nice. And then this talks about the importance of the home and engaging in the home so that you're working towards salvation and exaltation. That's another key phrase that you'll see throughout that. It's drilled into you as a member that all of this life, your entire life here, again, you're here to get a body and you're here to work towards something and that's salvation and exaltation. And that is drilled into you over and over and over. And this includes the five appointed responsibilities, which is living the gospel, caring for those in need, inviting all to receive the gospel. Another very common theme throughout this. Mormons are very much, especially now, uh, being told they need to spread the word of the gospel and allow others. <laughs> El wife is here just, you know. Being, being a little comedian off to the side. Inappropriate. Come here. I'm going to teach you what I'm teaching everybody else. Not really everyone, but anyway. So inviting everyone to receive the gospel is very important right now. You'll see that. And <laughs> there's a bunch of tips uh, when you look at young women's. And I remember a difficult research. Kresha, you talked to me about how <laughs> Lori and they were always inviting your daughter to church and because they were you're pretty much required to like you're not required to but it's like one of those things in the church you know you're often said oh it's a choice but it's not really a choice because you're kind of commanded to do it if she pees well she'll be crying if she's upstairs all by herself she will Excuse me. Okay. All right. Marie, come here. Why don't you act like you did in Catholic school and just roll stuff in the back? Anyway. So, supporting members and doing the work of salvation and exaltation. That's going to the temple. Going to church. Doing family home evening like we're doing tonight. Um, and then encouraging uh, that learning of the gospel at home. So a lot of families, I would say families that are more so, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, I see now. It's just tobacco, right? Because we live in Utah. It's not quite where we want it to be. I got nothing. I know. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> My gosh. You told me to do what I did in back of religion. I know. <laughs> My gosh. Okay. So you're supposed to make, here's another expectation, make your home a place of spiritual strength and joy where you're inviting the spirit of the Lord into your home through simple efforts. Every home can be a house of prayer, a house of fasting. We'll go over that because I think that's kind of a fucked up thing that you're required to do. I mean, you have a choice to do. When I say required, Please know that it is actually a choice. You're taught it's a choice. It's just, it's one of those choices where the alternative is not attractive. So you basically choose it. So learning, glory, house of order, house of God. And that means keeping your house clean, ladies. It's very important. There is a lot of Relief Society lessons, things like that. I remember growing up, they stress a lot to women, keeping your house tidy, keeping it clean, 
and all of that. And when you're looking at women that have seven damn kids, that's a lot to ask. Plus, some of these women, a lot of them have callings on top of that. So, for instance, I had a young women's leader. I think she was actually the president who had seven kids and they all had their activities. Her husband was stake president. So she had that. Then you're active in the relief, relief, relief society. And then you're responsible, too, for making sure that when you have members that are ill or when they have a family member pass away, that you're there for them, which usually means food. And I can tell you as someone, uh, when I was really little, my mom had surgery, emergency surgery. And so we got meals for a week from the Relief Society. And they were awesome. Good food. Free it is food good. is the best food. Mormon food is pretty good comfort food. I have to say that. I don't, I'm, food. I don't live in the South and I know I've heard a lot about the South, but Mormon food is pretty comfort food. Free food is the best food. That's the only, that's one thing I miss. I could have just been like, oh, I'm still struggling with my identity. Maybe you should bring me lasagna. You Gluten make good lasagna. I do make good lasagna. My mm. lasagna kicks ass. Gluten-free too. Anyway, so the Sabbath, Yummy. um, Personal worship through prayer and fasting. Fasting is only once a month. You are expected to fast once a month, though. I won't go into that. Gospel study, learning, nope. ministering, and service to others. Joyful family time. Not just family time. Joyful family time. We have gay family time. Shh. <laughs> Can't talk about being gay on this one. Gospel teaching and learning are home-centered. So at some point, I was talking about how a lot of families do scripture study, and I remember, I, I wouldn't say I lived with them, but we stayed, when I moved to another state, there's a lot more involved in that. Anyway, we stayed with the bishop and his family, and they had like seven kids, of course. And every morning they got up and did scripture study at five in the morning, and I'm not a morning person. They also did it at night. I remember doing it off and on because I, I really wanted those blessings of exaltation, damn it. Uh, but I was never really good at it. It was the same like when I was tired at night. <laughs> this is so bad. I don't know. You guys tell me. But I would be so tired at night and usually it would be like after swim practice. And I would lay in bed and be like, I'm going to say my prayers just lay in here. And then I'd be like, damn it, Jesus can see me. So I'd have to get out of bed and be on my knees and pray the way I was taught to pray because I felt guilty for praying, just laying in my bed as I fell asleep. So that's pretty common. Um, serving others, again, that's big, which is not a bad thing. These things aren't necessarily bad, but when you have them drilled into you over and over and over, it becomes problematic because it becomes something you feel, even though it's not necessarily meant in that respect, but it's an expectation and it can get toxic. I believe in toxic po positivity. I What's that Rachel, whatever her name is, anyway, who just like her career just took a huge dip because of the dumb stuff she said, but I'm not a fan of toxic positivity. I think we all have a right to have shitty days, to feel shitty, and to say shitty things. And I don't think telling someone they need to be happy or trying to force that on someone or make them feel guilty because they're not happy and maybe they're laying on the floor in a ball, curled up, crying. Like, they're not in really the space to cheer up right then right honey <laughs> <'Cause>, i agree because <laughs> i do not like it when people are like smile oh why? she does not like that why? at all why does it make you happy because all it's gonna do is piss me off yeah that's like a thing with so, her just whatever um so besides family home evening so spirit siblings um leaders are supposed to encourage families yes. to prioritize time together throughout the week and I mean, prioritize time together as in you already have all your church activities. So what else are you going to do? Well, you got to be with your family because you you have to be 
as little, receive as little influence from outside your bubble, your Mormon bubble, as possible. So I think that that is part, like when I look at Mormonism, when I look at what I grew up in and the culture I grew up in, and I look at it from more of a corporate organizational standpoint, I really think that this, a lot of this, like, be with your family, always be with your family, blah, 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 is more like, don't go outside because there are outside influences that may not be in line with what we're teaching. And then that creates a whole host of issues that we don't like because it results in us getting less revenue. Alcohol. We got temples to build and shit, people. <gasps> not alcohol. I mean, I... even just even just being friends with someone that's not Mormon, like is bad. even yeah, even when I was in high school and my best friend wasn't Mormon, she was Catholic. I people were like, Well, did you invite her to church? I'm like, she's Catholic. Well, so. she can still learn the gospel. It's the one true church. Well, she's pretty Catholic and she thinks three heavens are effing weird. So I'm going to be okay with that. I found out something today talking what? about revenue. Yeah. So um, there's a lady that works for a company <laughs> <laughs> that um, when they build the temples, how much it costs for the the carpet oh how much three hundred dollars a square foot did you guys hear that three hundred did you hear what she said what three hundred dollars a square foot to build a temple and people talk about how how like i i hear a lot of like oh the catholic church the catholic church and and granted yeah there's jewels and all sorts of stuff at the vatican and they charge money to go in uh, but they the can ceiling. go in. Paintings on the ceiling. Yeah, but 300 carpet. Meanwhile, they're like, everybody needs to give us 10%. We got to get these temples. Do you really need $300 a yard carpet? Like, what is that? Like, what? And I mean, fountain, I know what it is. It's gorgeous, but. And the fountain, I guess she said, is like in a closet. In a closet? Fountain? Mm -hmm. like baptismal the... font? No, not that one. Oh, <laughs> no, like the, um, I can't remember. Are you talking about the remodel of the Salt Lake Temple? No, no, she, oh. she was All talking about like Chicago and she named a couple other cities. There's like 200. Yeah, <laughs> but she just, she named like three or four cities. The Celestial, Celest Celestial Room. That yeah, that room. That is the room that Lori Daybell sat in all damn day holding hands with Melanie Kibb or Zulu Lama. Come on. Not gay. No, no. Come on. We're just roommates. Do you get vibes from Melanie Kibb? Ding, 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 ding. You just go up? Ding, ding, ding. Like crushes? Ding, ding, ding. I loved, I, I loved her. We she's were like sisters. She's favorite we person in the, in the world. And I can't live without her. I think the same with you. I think there was a weird swing thing going on. I, I don't know. I Tonight's mean. Tonight's my night. I don't say. And this was over and over in the text messages. If you guys have been through them. I know people have done shows. Or gone through them i keep meaning to do one where i really break down the religious um piece of it but if you look i'm like how many times are you gonna tell zuzu you love her and how many times is she gonna tell you like that's kind of weird i know i'm british and i know i'm like generally closed off to emotion but i just think it's weird to tell someone you love them constantly when they're just like a friend i mean and to also be like you're a powerful goddess yeah, no, that's weird. Yeah. I mean, I tell like my close friends. Yeah, but you know, but they were they would be like every text. No, nope. I mm -mm. love you. Hey, pretty girl. It's kind of like you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you yeah. hang up. No, that's you hang up. Exactly. I love yeah. you. No, I love yeah, you. Yeah, I definitely think there was weird sex stuff going on. Ew. Oh, and you guys, okay. This is off topic, but I just found this out. Okay. Apparently, I have it on good authority, as in someone told me, that there is this type of PORN. I don't know why I'm not monetized, but still. 
whatever. There's this PORN that is specifically catered to Mormons. And in these videos, they dress up in temple clothes, pretend they're in the temple, do stuff like that I don't think actually does go on in the temple. Although there is a uh, there is something that I just have to say because it's something I I don't know if it means anything or not. But if you watch the Netflix documentary Keep Sweet, and you watched uh, if they they show a scene of like their temple, which is a lot of similarities. We've talked about that before, and there's this bed slash altar. Thing. And they talk about like Warren Jeffs and his brides, clearly underage brides, and that things happen. Now, I I thought that's there's no way, and there's always been this like a uh, con conception or mis. I I don't know if it's a misconception anymore, but a lot of times I would hear from non Mormons or people that didn't know much about Mormons that oh. There's like this thing where you have sex on the altar in the temple. Like you literally consummate your marriage on the altar when you get, when you get married or have your endowment ceremony or get married. <clears throat> um, and I was always like, no, no. And I, I don't think it happens, but I was reading some old documents and there is a statement I wish I could find it because, uh, like, um, I don't like to say things unless I can be like, here, here it is. But it talks about how Helen Mark Kimball, who was 14 fucking years old when Joseph Smith married her. No, that was not normal. He was 37. That was not normal. Girls got married about 20 boys, about 22 back then. So yes, even though some of our grandparents got married at 14, it actually wasn't normal. And it wasn't normal for a 37 year old to marry a 14 year old when he was already married to someone else. Um, but anyway, there is something, and I think it's Heber C. Kimball that said it, which who was Helen Mark Kimball's father, their president of the church, one of the like third in command, I guess I would call him third, fourth. I don't know. Um, I think third, uh, he was weird. He was Kimball was like off the charts weird, but anyway, it talks about something like that, like the marital bed in the temple or something that I went, wait a minute. That was in keep sweet. Fucking insane. So anyway, yeah. I, I mean, yeah, that. <laughs> he touched what? <laughs> I'm gonna kick you in the face. Oh, wow. <laughs> that was awesome. God, you guys are funny. I like Mr. Mm -hmm. Clipper too. Sorry, Kathy. I'm taking Kathy's job from her. Um, yeah. So, as far as I know, that consummation doesn't happen in the temple. Uh, and even some of the other stuff that it wasn't that, but it was still weird. Like the anointing stuff, like on your, that doesn't happen anymore. Cause the church is like, yeah, you're right. That is totally weird. And it also crosses boundaries. So, um, I haven't really gone into detail on the temple. Um, mostly because I did, I haven't been through the temple myself, aside from baptisms for the dead. And that, that's a totally different part of the temple. So I can research it and everything, but I think there are people that can do a better job than me. Uh, Jordan McKay have talked about their experience in the temple. Exmo Lex has, um, Mormon discussions talks about the things that go on in there. And, um, so if you want to know more, like you want to dive into that and really know more. Those are the channels I would recommend. And then I would also recommend, um, it's probably not up to date, but the Tanners um, uh, have done, well, Gerald is dead, but Sandra Tanner, who is my freaking hero next to Eleanor Roosevelt, 
she, they did amazing amount of research. She was related to Brigham Young. She left the church and then they became these big time researchers and they're very credible, but they published a bunch of things about the temple ceremonies and how they've evolved over the years. So if you are curious now, and just know though, that that gets highly offensive to Mormons, highly offensive. Anytime you talk about the temple, it's sacred to them. So um, I know because I get in trouble all the time. How am I sharing my screen? I don't know. It says I'm sharing my screen. What the heck? Okay. Not anymore. Not anymore. Okay. Moving on. I forgot where it was. Okay. So we pretty much went through the family. I think uh, they talk about the relationship between the home and the church and what's expected. So it actually says... The work of salvation and exaltation is centered in the home, supported by the church. The following principles apply. So it's not, doesn't sound like, hey, if you're not too busy, um, leaders and teachers honor the roles of parents and they maintain effective communication with them. I don't think anybody has time for that shit. Um, they talk about just like how they check up on them basically to make sure that they're teaching the lessons accordingly there there are these units that they do they're called come follow me lessons and there's actually a lot of i wouldn't say a lot of companies but remember the whole preparing a people thing like they made these videos and they were called come follow me they're not official church videos but they just use that title clearly they are sanctioned somewhat because when someone had a dating site some mormon guy had a dating site one time and the church sued him because it was like Mormon match or something like that. And they're like, you can't use our names. So the fact that they let preparing a people use that name of those lessons, come follow me lessons, to me says, you know what I, I think it says. So then it talks about service, 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 which is great if you have time and if you have the resources. Um and it basically talks about how you will be blessed if you serve and sacrifice. So all of these things lead to blessings. And in Mormonism, just my opinion, that usually means money, to be honest. It usually is something, um, it's definitely there is a prosperity gospel involved in Mormonism. And I don't think it can be denied. I'm sure people would deny it, but... Yeah. So, and then there's like callings. There's another one, but I guess I didn't open it. Maybe because it talks about fulfilling. Maybe I was just on this. Yeah. Okay. So the next one is fulfilling your family responsibilities, which is damn near identical to the one we just went over. But that one really talks about um, again, like the mission of the Lord's church is to help all people come on to Christ. Families can help accomplish this as they provide for their own spiritual and physical needs and help meet the needs of others, share the gospel with others, see that family members receive temple ordinances and help provide those blessings for their ancestors who have died, which means baptisms for the dead, getting baptized for those that have passed on so that you're sharing the gospel with them. And I was trying to think of how that makes business sense. I know it does. Like there's got to be, I mean, obviously mm -hmm. with all those companies that do family research and stuff, that's a shit ton of revenue. Um, so, uh, and then it talks about like running the family and this, I was like, Oh, come on. So, Again, fathers are responsible to provide the necessities of life and protection for their families. Mothers are primarily responsible for the nurture of their children. But they are equal partners. It does say that they're equal partners. But I'm just saying, like, it's kind of a little bit old fashioned. Still, this is I pulled this today. Um, parents, what it says here, I really wish my screen share would work, but... Um, Parents see that the family has a clean home, wholesome food, clothing, medical, and dental care. Well, if they can fucking afford it, if they're paying 10%, guess 
want. Maybe they can't afford dental care or health care, more insurance, um, educational opportunities, instruction, manage, managing financial resources, and if possible, training on how to grow some of their own food. Why would they want training on how to grow their own food? Good question. It may have something to do with the second coming. And we're going to go into the whole prepping thing and where that comes from and what has been taught over the years. Because oh, it's it's wild, I tell you. Um, I'm trying not to get too close because like when I sometimes I watch them back and I'm like, Ugh. Um, so parents should teach children how to prepare their food and how to preserve it for later, later use, which is like canning and drying stuff i remember like we used to do like fruit homemade fruit roll-ups or stuff i remember we had to like do stuff like that you know so that our future husbands would be proud of us in the kitchen um uh plan and prepare to provide for family needs in times of sickness so savings is important again if you don't make that much money and 10 percent of your money is going to the church it's difficult to save and Utah has a very high bankruptcy rate. And I believe that that is part of the reason because people can't make it here. Like, I mean, housing has gone up everywhere, but it, it has gone up quite a bit in Salt Lake, mostly because the gays keep moving in. I don't know why I'm like, guys, it's not great here. Is it, you think it is because Salt Lake's liberal, but it's really not. But anyway, um, and then I like it says, if the father has trouble providing for the physical needs of the family, then they can go through uh, priesthood leaders, which is true. The Mormon church does provide, they do have like the church assistance program. I don't think it's called that, but I hate the word welfare. So I'm going to say assistance program. Um, and then children can help provide for the physical needs of their families by helping their parents with their work, studying well in school, taking care of their clothing, and where does it say keeping themselves and their home clean and neat, maintaining good health. That's oh, and other possessions. We don't have bacon here. <coughs> don't. Seriously, why are you doing that? Why? <laughs> you're supposed to be learning along with the other spirit siblings, I'm and you're learning. there. Even the dog is disappointed. No, she's not. Yes, she is. No, anyway, then it goes into sharing the gospel. Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. And it says every member of the church has the responsibility to share the gospel with others. This is true. Like you are a missionary. Every member a missionary. I think that was just in the last conference. And they are really stressing it now. I have a friend who works on Mormon stories with John DeLynn. And she was telling me that. The church opened a few years ago, these huge MTCs, missionary training centers, and they've had to close them because they are bleeding members. They like to say that they're growing, but they, that's just because people are having babies that have left the church and haven't like removed their membership from the roles. And so it's really more of a, like a birth rate and they're not, I think in some countries they are growing they tend to be countries that experience a lot of poverty. And when someone comes into your country and you are, you know, it's living in absolute poverty, not even relative poverty, absolute poverty. And they're like, if you hang out with us, we got a deal for you. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll help you out. You know, we'll provide this or provide that. And you can take that like you want. Like, I, it's a good thing that, like, the church does have some very good principles as far as helping and aiding in times of need. But also, when I heard $300 a yard for carpet, and then I thought about Salt Lake's homeless problem and how much land the church owns in the Salt Lake Valley alone. Like, UPS has a huge hub here. And it's church-owned land. Half the places I've worked are on church-owned land. I mean, they own a lot. a lot. They could literally, with that money, they could literally house all of the homeless people 
here. Like, so I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying like, it's kind of like Tom's shoes. Everyone's like, oh, Tom's, they donate a pair, but it costs them like $2 to make them. So, and, and they get a tax right off for that, remember. Anyway, so every member of the church has a responsibility to share the gospel with others. Family members should do all they can to help their relatives, friends, and neighbors learn about the gospel of Jesus Christ and the blessings it can bring them in their lives. Be good examples. Be grateful for your membership in the church. Ask acquaintances if they would like to know more about the church. Ask the Lord to help them select a family or individual who is ready to hear the gospel. So basically like, dear Heavenly Father, I don't know. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, I'll go let them know. Um, introduce the family or individual to the church in some way, such as by inviting them to a family home evening. We'll welcome everyone, only I'm not asking you to join the church tonight. Or to a church meeting or activity, giving them church books or pamphlets to read, talking with them about the blessings of the gospel. Here's how it works. <laughs> In my experience, as uh, when you're a teen, when you're the age of young women's, say you're not Mormon and your friend is, and she's in young women's and she's like, do you want to come to a fireside? They're really fun. And you're like, is that like a campfire? Like a bonfire? Like, that sounds kind of cool. Oh yeah, it's definitely fun. You can meet all my friends. And then you get there and you're like, why is this old guy talking? That's, this isn't a fireside. There's no fire to sit by the side of. This is in some cultural hall. And it smells like bad breath and wonder bread. <laughs> like, and mm -hmm. like, so there's a lot of that. I remember like my daughter was recruited all the time. Like, and we were always very nice about it. She was always nice about it. But all the time, even when she was little and it was, they were primary age. Oh, just come have fun. Just come. We're going to the water park. Actually, they didn't go to the water park because they all closed here, but like we're going here and it'll be so much fun. And then they just kind of pull you in and you join, in my opinion, a lot of people join because they think it's something it's really not. And they're not told about the older doctrines they're told about all the fun stuff and like who doesn't want to live in a forever family me kind of but that's because i don't like some members anyway so you know invite them to be taught by missionaries always i don't know about other other states how often the missionaries come around but even here missionaries walk down our block a few times a week they pass our house though because when I left the church, I had a, I had to have I had an attorney write my letter, um, and so in that letter it said, "Don't fucking contact me again." It didn't say that, but that was a message, and so I think that that actually worked. And a lot of times it doesn't work. People talk about all the time how they resign and missionaries keep coming over, which I like. You know, it's not their fault that they were sent on a mission. I mean, it kind of is, but really they were probably forced to. A lot of them are bribed with like trucks and stuff. A we, lot of my friends were. We had a couple guys come by. Or I was doing something out in front and they had they came by and asked if, if I needed any help or something. Yeah, you should let them. If you do, here's something I didn't know. My brother-in-law told me. Um, <clears throat> missionaries have to get kind of like really young women and young men have to get so many service hours. Like community service. Yeah, kind of. But their their goal is to just, you know, recruit you. Uh, but they do have to get so many hours. So if you need something done and the missionaries happen to stroll by, they actually are very happy to help out. Like that is something like they have to commit to those hours anyway. And they do a pretty good job. Didn't you have to help you one time move? Oh, I think I did. Yeah. When they part in the one apartment. Yeah. Yeah. And then this cute missionary couple 
like a lot of times people that are retired, they, they go on missions too as a couple. They came when I was moving into that apartment. Mm -hmm. This is like after my divorce. So I was moving into that apartment and it's like this sweet old couple and they came and I saw their badges. I'm like, uh oh, we're apostates. You might not want to get too close. And they're like, no, we like apostates. Do you need any help? And I'm like, sir, I'm pretty sure both of you have osteoporosis, but thank you. No, um, we had a good conversation. Mm -hmm. They were really nice people. I mean, they're, they're, they're nice. nice. They're nice people. Yeah. So anyway, they are for the most part, pretty nice. You know, they, they happen to believe in something that I don't think is healthy, but, uh, to each their own, to each their own. I just, I get into this because I want people to see kind of like where these things came from, because a lot of people ask like, why was Lori so like into seeing Jesus and, and being like this very important person and all of these things. And I have to say it comes from how she was raised and comes from the goal of every Mormon, which is to receive revelation and spiritual guidance. And it says in these documents, if I can find them, but anyway, um, family members. So you already have to maintain your health, take care of your possessions and your clothes, keep yourselves and your home clean and neat. All of these things, right, to be a, a good family. And then it says, improve ability to read, write, and do basic arithmetic. Okay, that's what school's for. Oh, wait, a lot of them don't like that anymore. Um, take advantage of every opportunity to obtain knowledge and improve skills. Totally agree with that. If I were independently wealthy, I would be in school till I die. I love school. Um, so I totally agree with learning new things and getting outside of your perspective I don't think that that's what this particular guidance wants, but, <laughs> but overall, like I totally agree with you. families should store a year's supply or as much as possible of the basic items needed to sustain life. Avoid unnecessary debt, save for the future. So some of these are like fine, but you think like, just keep piling them on, pile them on. Cause that's how it is. It's like, um, one way to help those in need is by fasting each month, contributing to fast offerings. So I'll just actually talk about that here. So fasting is uh, once a month. I actually thought it was like normal for all religions. I guess it's not. Uh, members, it's called Fast Sunday. And you take... For a 24 hour period, usually it's like Saturday afternoon to Sunday afternoon, and then you totally chomp down on Sunday night. Sunday night, family pot roast. But you go without food and drink for 24 hours if you're physically able. So, like if you're diabetic, they're not gonna be like, too bad. I mean, they they're not gonna like require you to do it if you can't do it. Um, but they say to do that. So you go without food and then you use that money that you would spend on that food to offer as a fast offering to help those in need. So aside from tithing, and it's I'm sure it's all electronic now, but aside from tithing, Mormons are expected, there are several funds you can give to. So you can give to a missionary fund because believe it or not, missionaries pay for their missions. They're, they pay for them. Do God's work. Here's they, money with yeah. no job. The, well, no, it's do God's work. Give us money <laughs> so you can do God's work. Well, yeah, but that's what I'm saying is you yeah. have to pay for something and you don't even have a job. Well, you're supposed to save for your mission from the time you're yay high. Again, or your parents are supposed to save. They're already giving enough. Yeah, well, that's the way it works. Well, anyway. So you have your missionary fund, you have your tithing, you have then what's called fast offering. I think there's actually one specifically for temples, but I don't remember for sure. I feel like there's another one. So if someone is or was a member, type that into the chat because I think I'm missing one. Maybe I'm not, but so fast offering is basically you're giving to families in need. So the church has their assistance program and supposedly 
now there there has been some things that have come out recently about how the church manages its finances and the church has never been known to be transparent with its finances they say they are but what they mean it what they do is they're like the transparency report and then they get up and they're like we're transparent <laughs> that's that's pretty much all you know but technically your tithing goes to build temples and churches and grow the church that way and then your fast offerings go to help those in need. So those who are seeking assistance from the church. And usually if you are seeking assistance from the church, you are also expected to do service to the church in addition to the service you're already doing. So it's uh, it's a, a lot, which I'm not opposed to that, but it's a lot. And I think this is where like the fasting gets out of hand for a lot of people because you're also told that when you fast, you are getting blessings for it. So there are members that fast more than they need to. Some fast, you know, if they have like a family member with an illness, they'll fast hoping that that family member will get better. Sometimes in church, the bishop will ask everyone to fast if there's a member that's sick stuff like that. So there are like extra fasts, but generally at least the first Sunday of every month, you do a fast Sunday, you don't eat or drink for 24 hours. And it's torture when you're a kid because <laughs> you are expected to, I, I think generally like once you're baptized, some people can make their kids do it sooner. I can imagine. So anyway, it goes into more sharing the gospel, all of that jazz and temple ordinances. So, so you already have a ton of expectations with the family. Um, and it kind of went over like the um, good and bad. Like, yeah, I just want to highlight this one because this is a very common, common gaslighting technique. No one is better at gaslighting than the Mormon church. I mean, come on. Like, we never taught about planets. You guys know, I opened the scriptures. I showed you the scripture that said kingdoms, dominions, planets, all of that. Like, it says planets in the scriptures. Um, but, yeah, a lot of times, depending on who the bishop, there are some bishops that are more, like, uh, giving than others. But a lot of times you're told, just keep praying. You just got to pray for it. You, you just have to pray harder. Or, and, and then if, when, when it really isn't coming true and you're like, but I've been praying a lot and I've been doing everything you've told me to do. I've been fasting. I've been doing all these things. And it's not happening. And they're like, oh, well, then it's meant to be. <laughs> it's meant to be, <laughs> you know. Um. The, I mean, talks, I, and I know it's not unique, but one of the things that has always bothered me is someone that had, you know, I have a brother, he's more like a foster brother who passed away. He had a genetic disease of, that was fatal. And one of the things that has always bothered me is this attitude, like when a child gets injured or a child dies, if they're injured and tell that it's like, oh, they pulled through and there's all these stories and you hear them at conference about how everyone prayed for so-and-so who fell down the well and they were healed and it was great. And they even met Jesus down the well. And see, that's a testament that the church is true. That's a testament. And then when someone else's kid dies, it's, oh, well, it was meant to be. They're in a better place. Like, you don't you know that. That's my little rant on that. But I'm just trying to illustrate like the gaslighting that goes on can be really harmful. So I actually want to go over like, so we have the fasting. Now let's talk about word of wisdom. Oh, you didn't know that they control what you eat too? Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's actually not called word of wisdom anymore, even though it was on the website. Maybe they changed it back. But it turned into some like healthy living type of thing. And it sounded like an MLM name. But uh, 
the word of wisdom to Mormons is a commandment for your physical and spiritual benefit. So you are commanded to follow the word of wisdom. It's not like, please avoid coffee. It's not that great for you. It's like, uh, you drink coffee. That's really bad. Um, the word of wisdom talks about like fruits, herbs, vegetables, like all of those are good. Great. Um, meat is to be eaten sparingly. Apparently Joseph Smith was kind of like, he felt bad killing animals, but he also sacrificed a lamb or something like when he was a kid, like way, like that's another thing that they're like, oh, that didn't happen. It did. Uh, and then uh, the following substances are harmful. Like, you know, Mormons don't drink because, you know, Mitt Romney, uh, when he was running for president, he talked about that, I think, tobacco, tea and coffee, um, hot drinks is what is written in the Doctrine and Covenants. Some people, some more extreme Mormons, believe that means Diet Coke. And to those Mormons, I say, no, like, you have to have one vice, even though coffee is probably better for you than Diet Coke. Um, if you follow the word of wisdom, which again is commanded, uh, you are promised increased health, wisdom, knowledge, and protections. I don't know what kind of protections. Maybe it's the same kind of protections if you're wearing your garments in a car accident. There's like that whole story of like, someone was wearing their garments and they were in a car accident and they were injured everywhere, but where their garments are or their garments protected them, they were like shot, but the bullet just didn't even hit them. Bounce like there's right just off. weird Come stories down. about how protective garments are. And it's like hmm. their underwear. I'm going to take nothing. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, so that's that. And then it talks about nutritious eating, regular exercise, proper hygiene, getting sufficient rest. So if you look at like Tylee and Lori and the pressure that Tylee was under, which I think she was under a lot of pressure, she's under pressure to eat right, to exercise, to do all these things. And then to fulfill all of the um, requirements of young women, um, including modesty, which is my favorite chapter because... What I love about it is that they went out of their way not to refer to a gender, but it's very clear <laughs> what gender they're referring to. So it starts out by saying modesty is an attitude of propriety and decency in dress, grooming, language, and behavior. If we are modest, we do not draw undue attention to ourselves. In other words, slut it up. Instead, we seek to glorify God in our body and in our spirit because God does not appreciate tank tops, tank tops. Like, mm -mm, no, those aren't good. Hair and, shoulders. But what's interesting is like a lot of people have noted this, that Lori wore swimming suits and then she's wearing that fucking cocktail dress um, on the mortar on the morning. Ugh the morning of Charles' murder, and people were like, how is she getting away? Well, we know at that point she wasn't wearing garments anymore. But also in some climates, I've had Mormons tell me that it's so freaking hot and humid that they don't necessarily abide by the whole, you know, modesty, like wearing the t-shirt under the tank top because you can't just wear the tank top. You got to cover up those shoulders, gals. And, you know, the knee length shorts and all of that. So one of the things that I remember this, and I'm sure Tylee was totally taught this. Um, you're told, like, if you're unsure, if you're modest, like if you try on your outfit and you're like, I don't know, uh, that you're supposed to ask yourself, would I feel comfortable with my appearance if I were in the Lord's presence? And I'd be like, would anybody, but, and then another question is when it comes to language, <laughs> which is something I was never good at controlling, would I say these words or participate in these activities if the Lord were present? And then it talks about dressing modestly, which is the human, it is because our bodies are a temple. It actually didn't say this, which I thought was a little strange because I remember your body is a temple being like, not a wonderland, okay? It's not a wonderland. It's a temple. 
um, being told that so many times, treat your body like a temple. Um, the, in this particular guideline, it's said that the human body is God's sacred create creation. We must respect our bodies as a gift from God through our dress and appearance we know how precious our bodies are, or we can show the Lord that we know how precious our bodies are by covering them up, I guess. Um, our clothing expresses who we are and it sends messages about us. It influences the way we and others act. And when we're well-groomed and modestly, dr modestly dressed, we can invite the companionship of the spirit and exercise a good influence on those around us. Okay, well, do you want to know how many bitches I knew growing up that dressed modestly? Like a lot. I still know some. Um, but then it talks about the central to the command to be modest. It's a command to be modest. Is an understanding of the sacred power of procreation, which is the ability to bring children into the world. Clearly, they're not talking to boys. This power is to be used only between husband and wife revealing and sexually suggestive clothing, which includes short shorts and skirts, tight clothing and shirts that do not cover the stomach, can stimulate desires and actions that violate the Lord's law of chastity. You can make the boys horny, in other words. We don't want to make the boys horny because then they do what they do. Um, in addition, we should avoid extremes in clothing, appearance, and hairstyle. I remember being told you shouldn't dye your hair at all. Or if you dye your hair, you shouldn't dye it any funky colors. So when I dyed it jet black, there was a little bit of chitter chatter. Um, always be neat and clean. Never sloppy or inappropriately casual. Should not disfigure ourselves with tattoos or body piercings. And if you're going to get your ears pierced, only get one pair none of that double whole thing that's not no so express yourselves through clean positive uplifting language and in actions that bring happiness to those around us our efforts to be modest in the word and deed lead to increased guidance and comfort from the holy ghost again follow this you'll get blessings follow this you'll get blessings avoid filthy language I just wanted to say that. Clearly, I didn't do that. No. But if you swear, and it says this, and I remember hearing it when I was growing up, you can't hear the Holy Ghost if you say fuck. <gasps> you can't. He's like, I'm out. I can't handle this. Wow. Jen, did you get to dress modestly? Well, I was a swimmer. Um, I think about like my junior, senior year. I, was, I started to get over, like, I mean, because I'd had such a bad experience. It would have been my senior, I think. I said had such a bad experience at camp and with the girls at camp that I kind of didn't care. But <laughs> Under Armour, hey, that's a good one. I bet they'll use that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wore, I mean, one-piece swing suits. Uh, and then, yeah, I did wear two pieces because I was a teenage girl and it was hot and stuff like that. So I, I guess according to, I did get in trouble. I do. I do remember getting in trouble once I went to young women's and I was told that my skirt was too short. And I, I, I mean, I guess I could have said like, lucky for you, I'm a total les. So no boys are getting near this, but I didn't think of it then. <laughs> I was more concerned with the fact that I was going to go to hell. So then you have, as far as expectations, actually, I want to go over young women's because this is this one. Uh oh, I have to pull it back up. Or maybe it's there. No. Okay. So young women's, let me pull it up so I can remember. There's a whole bunch of stuff. So, Put yourself in Tylee's, Tylee's position with the mom she has, who already is like trying to pretend she's perfect, right? Because everyone was like, Lori was just this perfect mom. She acted. She was a good actress. 
she was a great actress. I can give her that. And no mom is perfect, but definitely not Lori fucking Daybell. Anyway, so the Young Women's Organization, the purpose is to prepare girls to live in his presence, God's presence. So you strive to keep your covenants with God, then you'll be armed with righteous and with the power of God in great glory. Every time I hear the word glory, I think of Lori in her testimony where she's like something power and glory. Like she goes off and like thinks, I don't know. A lot of the things she says are just, they're all over the teachings and stuff. So it's just funny because I'll, I'll recognize them. And I'm like, yeah, that's well, Lori said, it's also all over the place. So the purpose of young women's, which again is 12 to 18 is to help young women make and keep sacred covenants and deepen their conversation with Jesus Christ and his gospel. So the purpose of class is to help you work together to accomplish the work of salvation and exaltation. So you are always working towards salvation and exaltation, even when you're a kid, you're, that's drilled into you. Young women serve others, fulfill their covenant responsibilities, build unity, learn and live doctrine. So when I was growing up, I don't know if I'm going to remember it. Let's see. Um, I don't think I can. We are daughters of God who loves us and we love him. There's like this whole chant. I said chant once and someone's like, it's not a chant. It's a motto. But it changed. So the current young woman theme and they, you repeat this at the beginning of young women's every Sunday. Like, like we are daughters of God who loves us and we love him. We will stand as witnesses of Christ at all times, in all places, in all things. Oh, I can't, I forgot it. I forgot it. Don't remember it. I just knowledge, good works and integrity, whatever. Um, anyway, the current one is, you want to say it with me? No. I'm a beloved daughter of heavenly parents. Well, that's so nice that they added heavenly mother in there, even though we still don't know what the hell she does with a divine nature and eternal destiny. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, I strive to become like him. I seek and act upon personal revelation, revelation, and minister to others in his holy name. I will stand as a witness of God at all times and in all things and in all places. So they left that part the same. They basically changed the whole thing. And a witness of God is, I will spread the gospel. I'll recruit. I will make sure that I do my part of the every member of missionary thing. As I strive to qualify for exaltation, I cherish the gift of repentance and seek to improve each day. With faith, I will strengthen my home and family, make and keep sacred covenants, and receive the ordinances and blessings of the holy temple. AKA, I am going to get barefoot and pregnant as soon as possible because that's what I'm supposed to do. That's part of my covenants. Get married, have babies, replenish the earth or whatever ordinances, all of that, that is the expectation. The expectation on Tylee. And, and there are more progressive, but when we look at Lori Daybell, we are looking, we aren't looking at progressive Mormons. We aren't looking at a lot of Mormons today. We are looking at hardcore extremist or very orthodox Mormons. So I'm interpreting this for the eighties, which is when that was normal Mormonism. So the expectation on Tylee was always to get married and have children and do what her mom told her so that she could enjoy salvation, exaltation. And if she effed up, then that meant Lori effed up because Lori's salvation also depends on the kind of mother she is or or what people perceive of her, which is, I think, part of the reason why Lori always had to be needed and give these talks and be primary president and take on these roles because she had to prove, I think, even in a way to herself, she didn't do a very good job, that she was 
a good mom because her eternity relied on it. And then she went in that in a different direction. And we all have our interpretations or we all have our opinions on that. I personally think that it does not excuse her. I'm going to say that first. I do not feel any, I do not feel sorry for her. I mean, it doesn't excuse her, but I do think she's very, very ill. And I don't think she is, I think she's like, that's just my opinion. Just based on what I've seen of her behavior, it just is so detached. And, and I told Kresh this, told difficult research this, the comment, the thing that will always stick with me that I always remember it. It's like, um, in my mind all the time is when Charles is talking to the police and he says, she's gone. She's, I, he doesn't say detached. He uses another word like disconnected like this. She's not her. And that's, that's the way I think about it because he was trying to get her help. And so I feel like when I, like, if I don't consider that, then I don't, I don't know. Cause he might be like, no, that bitch is totally evil. I, I didn't call that one. Right. Like, you know, but I, I think she is. So I think she became dark. She became evil because she was so obsessed with her position in life and in eternity and nothing was going to stand in her way because she needed to be the most important person. She needed fame as uh, having the role of someone, a gatherer and a, a member of the elect, the ultra elect, because in Mormonism, Mormons are the elect, but the ultra elect. So, Parents are responsible to teach their children the gospel and help them live it. And this, I don't know why this is in the young woman's thing, but basically a gospel learning. So leaders study the gospel and share it with young women. And then the young women are supposed to share at church what they are learning at home. Can you imagine being tightly? They're like, so tightly, what, what did you guys do this week? What did you, um, practice at home. And she's like, Oh, uh, my mom was doing some fucking casting out thing. And she claimed my, uh, dad or stepdad, Charles was like some dragon, you know, nothing new. Like, um, but I think more people believed in Lori or believed Lori definitely than believed Charles. Like she was supportive. Like, I don't think, I think both her and Chad, they were enabled by everyone around them and including members of the church and leaders of the church. They were enabled um, because no one thinks like, oh, that lady's getting crazy tomorrow. She's going to kill her kids. Like, that's not something that they process, but they had a responsibility and they did and they dumb fucked up. Um, young women meet on Sundays to strengthen faith, build unity, strengthen families and homes, strengthen families and homes, make plans to accomplish the work of salvation and exaltation. So Tylee was expected to kind of be like a second mom to JJ. That's not uncommon. It is not uncommon for the older child or the oldest child to take on the role of a parent because a lot of parents are doing callings or busy with like your other siblings. And so it is very common for the older sibling to become almost like a second parent, like the whole, um, not quite like the Duggars, but you know how, when you watch the Duggars before you knew that they were totally effed up, um, which took me like three episodes, the older ones watching the younger, like that's totally normal. And that would have been, and I think Tylee loved JJ and she was very protective of JJ and um, everything. She was also a teenager. She was a teenager. She was 16 years old. And every damn day, her mom was like, I got to go to the temple. I got to go to the temple. You need to. I mean, she was basically JJ's mom. And she was expected to be like that. That's if she had gone to Young Women's and complained about it, she would have gotten gaslit. 
Like, it would have been like, oh, Tylee, that's... Like, can you imagine? I think if Tylee, we don't know, but I would be willing to bet that if Tylee had gone to her leaders and been like, my mom's doing like real crazy shit now, they would have been like, oh, Tylee, she's just very, she's just, you know, being a, being, doing what she's supposed to do, her temple work, family history, you know, letting the angels find people for her, um, hearing the spirit of Christ. And it says it even this stuff, class presidencies, which are the girls in your, so like your 12 year olds, you have, it used to be called beehive. I don't think they have names anymore. There was like, you went to like beehive, Maya maids, or yeah, Maya maids, and then laurels, which I don't even know what those were, but laurels were the oldest. And in all of those classes you had the presidency of each and they were always bitches um they were <laughs> they were usually like leaders kids so they would be like the bishop's daughter and the second counselor's daughter and the elder's choir daughter and then really society president like it's all who you know even in at that level so they talk about like accomplishing the work of salvation and exaltation Service and activities should build testimonies, strengthen families, foster class unity, provide opportunities to bless others, balanced among four areas of personal growth, spiritual, social, physical, and intellectual. Like, and then it goes into camp, talks about personal development. This used to be called, it was just like what Young Women Values. It was like a handbook. And it was just values and there were seven of them. So I guess they like pared them down. So yeah, because there used to be seven, personal progress. Now it's called personal development. So semantics. Um, so you set goals in these four areas. And then, and they're usually stuff like, I don't even remember. I remember I had the book and it was like, what will you do for the Kit Kat? Yeah. Yeah. It was like, I'm trying to think like good works. And Klondike I was like, bar. I was like, I'll clean the house for good works. <laughs> Knowledge. Um, I'll read a book. And I was already a reader. So what would you do for a Klondike I didn't bar? get my met medallion. And a lot of, you get a young woman's medallion when you're 18. If you, do, if you get through all of these personal I guess they're not development. I don't know if they still do. But when I was in church, you would work for all these years and you'd pass off these progress, which have to do with like all these values you should have. And then you get your medallion and then you get married and you're like, I have a medallion. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um. Young women should have regular opportunities <coughs> to serve others in and with their families during youth activities on their own. You can get ideas for service on the church website. <laughs> and then, of course, inviting all to receive the gospel. And this is like a long, sec a long section. And we've already gone over it. But basically, set a good example. Share your testimony. <laughs> they talk about that in conference, too. Like, Elizabeth Wilson was a young woman at 14 and I got a letter from her. Actually, no, it starts out like this. I received a letter from a young lady who shared with me a story about how she met a friend in school and her friend was not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so she befriended her and they became good friends and she invited her to family home evening. And then she invited her to young women's. And her friend wanted to know more. And so then she invited her to even more. And bing, boom, bing, yada, yada. Guess what? She converted. And everyone's like, yay, she converted. Yay. What about me? I need to convert someone, right? Every member of missionary. We're inviting friends. Sharing your testimonies. I have had people share their testimonies with me. Uh, at ward dances. Well, because we were supposed to dance so we would get married. And Bible distance. So you have these ward dances or stake dances, region dances. Doesn't matter. Anyway, you dance like this, like, 
like this. We're, we'll demonstrate. Where are my hands? Um, you can put them on my waist. Hold on. I got to see to make sure you're in the thing. I can't see I this document. I am. Okay. All right. This is how you dance at a region dance. Not like that. Uh -huh. You're too close. You're too Hi. close. Too close. Book of Mormon space. Book of Mormon Bible and Doctrine and Covenants space. And Pearl of Great Price. I don't know how big those books are. <laughs> They're big. Okay. Well, a quad is big. Okay. So then you put your hands like this. On your hips. And I put my hands like this. And we just kind of like rock. And back. then this boy, I was doing this with a boy. And he goes, hi, my name is Solomon. I'd like to share my testimony with you. And I was like, okay. And I was like, hi, my name's Michelle. I'm gay. I like girls. Hubba, hubba. I don't think you said that because you're Catholic and you were not. You were not Mormon. You were a gay Catholic instead. Not a gay Catholic. Anyway. Yes. Doing. Ooh. I dip. You dip. You um, dip. So, yeah, and young women are expected to serve missions, but a lot do. Um, and then the Relief Society is like the adult version of that. We've been doing this a really long time, so I'll wrap it up. The Relief Society is like a grown-up version of young women's, you know, all these things. And then the priesthood one, the principles of the priesthood, are um, priesthood authority and priesthood power. Now, technically, everyone is supposed to have priesthood power, which is basically the gift or the power to act within your ward calling. Women do have that. But men have the authority of the priesthood, which means they lead the household, lead the family. They're in charge. Subtly. Now, I know a lot of Mormon women that are like, uh, no. Um, but Technically, that's the teaching. <laughs> oh, I feel bad. You're running a fever. That sucks. Is it COVID? I haven't had COVID yet. I'm pretty sure I'm going to get it. No, we will not. Well, I got to get my booster. But the thing is, is like, <laughs> so we're, I'm in public health and I show up to class and they're like, you have to wear masks. And I'm like, okay, all right, it's public health. Like, you got to set a good example. Like, you do in Mormonism, I guess. I walk in, there's like 60 people in this classroom. Like, we are literally, we're going to demonstrate again. We're like this. Hi, welcome. And I'm like, a mask isn't going to save us. Hi, how are you? How are you? What are you doing? Oh, you should look at me. Oh. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, compared to what all the women have to do, you know, salvation, exaltation, take care of the family, all this, da -da 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 -da, service, blah, 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 and relief society, all of that. And then the men are like, uh, yeah, they can, like, give blessings. Yeah. You want a blessing? Bless you. No, that's not how it works. Oh. Um, but so the expectations on women are extremely high. That is expectations as far as your church callings, expectations as far as your family. Is your house clean? Are your kids decent? Are they smart? They have to be smart. If your kids aren't smart, that's not going to end well. No, um, they're brilliant. Yeah. Um, and then I, the physical appearance, that is something... That really, I think, was part of the dynamic between Tylee and her mom. And I don't know. Lori seems like someone who was always thin. Maybe she wasn't when she was younger. Some people aren't. And then they thin out. Like I did. I was I was a really I was really poly when I was a baby and a toddler. I was I was pretty round. Oh, hunk a chunk. I was. I was cute, though. Now you're just a hunk. I was cute. I had, like, three knees, but I was cute. Um, I have, like, two chins, see? Yeah. But I would say... <laughs> well, just because you did that, that's, like, me when I go back. <laughs> but, yeah. So, so, Tylee had all those expectations. And then the physical expectations. And it is very judgmental, the culture 
there are, I would say the percentage, I want to do a study because I can't prove this. It's the same thing I have a, I was telling true crime sushi. My theory is that Mormon men are bigger purse than any other men, um, just from experience. And my other experiment that I want to do is like finding out what the eating disorder percentages are among Mormon women and girls, because I have a feeling that they're higher than the average. Cause we know like, we know like the data, if it's going to be done by BYU, it's going to be totally skewed because there was some study and I haven't looked it up that said that Utah was like the fourth happiest state. And I was like, give me a fucking break. Cause we're all on drugs. We're all on drugs. Yeah. Pharmaceuticals. Like, and if we're not on drugs, we're taking weird MLM products, like Mama, shakes and weird stuff. Mama loves money. And yeah, it's definitely not the fourth happiest. Give me a break. No, people literally struggle here. We we also have, if we're the fourth happiest state, how is our um, unaliving yourself rate so high, our, our suicide rate? Especially among teens and youth. It's very high in Utah. Very high. Um, one year, six alone at one high school. Like. So if we're that happy, why do we have all of these issues with suicide? Answer me that, BYU. Because it's always them that does the study. They're like, Mormon women are happier than non-Mormon women. I'm like, okay. So anyway, that's it. Um, I think we're done. Maybe I'll go back and look through. Because I didn't really get to look through. But if you have any questions... Leave them in the chat. Um, oh, keep the money in the family. Is that way more affluent families get more exotic mission placements? I would, I would, um, I would bet that <laughs> it would, but that's not something I ever thought of because obviously, if your family can't really, there are families that can't afford to send their kids on mission. Although, like when I was married to my ex, my sister in law, who was a widow couldn't really afford to send my nephew and he ended up going to Brazil and then he got like some weird parasite and it was a huge thing. Yeah. The parasite was a huge thing. Well, like he was sick and then like, they wouldn't let him come home. They're like, Oh, where's he now? In the Amazon. He's in Alaska. He's the one in Alaska. Oh, that one. Yeah. So oh, Alaska is gorgeous. And I have friends in Alaska. He, he's, there's he's, just some things different. Yeah. He's different anyway i'm not talking hunter like that no. kind of like no you know uh libertarian type different i'm talking about different and not different in the gay way different no he has a wife and like four kids he also <laughs> actually <laughs> you, you were a wife with two kids okay no um but he also uh, and this is true this is what happens a lot too his wife has diabetes. She has celiac. Her diabetes is bad. Like she has a pump, an insulin pump. So it's hard to control. Her doctors told her, you probably shouldn't get pregnant. You should probably adopt. They have three kids. Not only that, but they had the first kid. And then they found out that that child had, I don't know what it's called, but it's some type of genetic disorder. And it can be passed on. And X Men, yeah. See an X Men, and they usually oh, nice. will say like, you know, you may want to adopt if you have a child. That's like what what happened in my case with my brother. Um, but they needed to fulfill the work. I mean, like my own family member, her mother in law saw five children in the temple. She said, "You're going to have five kids." Four will be boys and one will be a girl. And my family member believed it to her core. My mother-in-law saw him in the temple. She saw all of them. She saw my little girl. She, she said, and then guess what? She had infertility issues. Like, um, that happens a lot. But yeah, I, I would bet that more affluent families probably do get assigned to more exotic locations because like if the church is going to help pay for someone's mission with which they do sometimes 
they're gonna like be like you can go to Provo, Utah. That's that's right. That's exotic. You still can't see your family. Like, don't even think about like going up to Salt Lake and seeing them. They're a little better now, though. And don't you dare soak. <laughs> oh yep. yeah. I How is that it. a new thing? I said it. I did. Yeah, JGS mom. I feel like it's kind of disrespectful too. I didn't feel like this growing up. I didn't feel like this at all. But as I got older, I was like, you know, I was told you need to invite your friend to church. You need to invite your friend to church. And I was like, but she's Catholic and her parents go to church every Sunday. Like she's not Catholic light. She's Catholic. And it was like, yeah, but this is the one true church. Like, so what is your problem? Because they're also told there's also these stories about how the missionaries stopped by the home of this Catholic family and that family said, no, we're not interested. They said it over and over. And then one day the missionaries were able to get in the door and they all converted and they're all super happy. Like there's just so many, if you watch conference and we can, we can have a drinking game. If you guys want, it's mm -hmm. long though. If you watch, you will notice it's the same talk. It's the same talk as the last conference, as the conference before that. They just requote and requote and requote. It's the same, same thing, different conference. Um, do all these rule makers follow the rules? No, I can tell you that for sure. There was just recently in, was it Utah County? Some sure. bishop who was also mayor was abusing children for years as young as two years old so i would say no i would say a lot of the rule makers feel entitled to break the rules which i always felt weird because i was always i always felt guilty over everything so yeah not all the way let's see squirrels religio economic system oh it's totally it's totally like that I could, I could go on about um, the fact that it's supposed to be a <laughs> theocracy. What what did you see? What Linda said. Well, I can't see. <laughs> oh, I'm <almost> choked <laughs> when I saw your visible smoky thing. <laughs> she does that. She does a lot of stuff like behind me. And so I don't know. And then I get in trouble. You don't get in trouble that much. I get scolded. It's just that I get Paris easily. Why? The LDS church doesn't have an MLM for a med dental kind of like prepaid legal. No, but they do have beneficial life. And they have a lot of other, but like, I wouldn't be surprised. They, no, I don't think they do. No. Uh, just kind of weird, right? Because they're always like, you know, they don't like stuff like that, like healthcare and stuff. And so it's like you could maybe like help your members out that, you know, can't afford cancer treatment. Like that happens all the time. Um, have 10 kids and give us 10% of your income or you won't see your brood ever again. I mean, that's true, right? If you don't pay tithing, you're not going to get into the celestial kingdom. You're not going to go through exaltation and you're not going to have an eternal family. Like think about this in the terms of like these People like Lori Daybell. If she didn't do this and she didn't do this and she didn't do this, it wasn't going to happen. So she had to do this and she had to do this and she had to do this. And she made it okay in her mind somehow. I don't fucking know how. But that was part of like her psyche, I think, was you got to do this, do this, do this, do this, keep going. And I think too, like part of the thing, I think Tylee was... She was a smart girl, but I think she was also like, something's not right. Um, but I think she felt like she had to protect her mom because of probably what she was told. Um, financial impact of tithing create a dependency on the church. Another way to keep the numbers up. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I know people, and it's not right. I don't think it's right at all. But I know people that like were not really active in the church. But they would go to their bishop and they would be like, listen, we're super poor. We need help. 
usually though what happens is it backfires and the bishop's like oh okay we'll help you uh we need you to volunteer at the church storehouse four hours a week we need to make sure you get your temple recommend and you need to be going to church every sunday and taking the sacrament how's that sound they're like ah oh, shit i'll be poor um no i there are people that take advantage of it i think it all depends on your bishop they definitely seem to help the homeless more in Salt Lake than other places. I heard it's because Mormons help pay for housing. Actually, that's not true. <laughs> um, Utah actually had a very good model called Housing First. And it's based on this um, belief that, you know, on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, your number one is your shelter. And so if you provide someone with shelter, then other things improve. And it worked. We cut homelessness in Salt Lake by like over 90%. There's an NPR article you could probably Google and find. It was like incredible. And then the legislature is like, oh, um, we want to fund like roads. And actually we do need roads funded. We want to fund like dumb shit that we're involved in like real estate construction or whatever. Bread. We want to move the prison because... We want to build a prison that sinks into the Great Salt Lake. Like, yeah. seriously. Yeah. They, it, that prison cost a billion dollars. It was supposed to cost 200 million. They were like, oops. Took them, what, four years to finally get the foundation where it wasn't sinking. I don't know. Um, so I think Mormons help as far as, like, uh, they help employ people, like, with Deseret Industries and stuff. Um, and... A lot of times it's hard to employ people. Um, so they do that and they do good work and everything. But I wouldn't say that they have done incredible work for the homeless. I I couldn't point to anything where I would be like, oh, the Mormon church did that. Um, and it helped homelessness. A lot of it just has to do with funding, which has dried up a lot. And that was federal funding actually dried up a ton. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm sure they say they did. <laughs> I'm sure they're like, we solved it. <laughs> what? What'd you read now? Well, what Tom wrote and then what Tina said. I don't think we are supposed to encourage. Oh, I think. <laughs> no. Because then it's okay. it becomes her show. It's supposed to be my show. It is your show. No, it's your show. Uh, you're it can be your you're Johnny too. Carson. I'm Ed I'm, McMahon. <laughs> Well, no, that doesn't make sense. Isn't Johnny it's, Carson the funny one? It's his show. He's technically a comedian. Okay, but you, you and are. I'm like, here's but it's Jenny. Not like, it's <laughs> not like, yeah. Well, it's like Conan and Andy. I don't know. Sometimes Andy's. I don't. I don't know. It used to be women didn't go on missions because they were expected to stay home and prepare to be wives. Yeah, they they used to almost. Not discourage it, but it was kind of like, well, if you haven't found a guy, I guess you can go on a mission. Will weed ever be legal in Utah? Uh, if citizens have their way, like we had a freaking ballot um, initiative or what? Not initiative. It got it was put on the ballot. And it passed. And then the legislature was like, oh, no, uh, some of us are pharmacists and also have stock in pharmaceutical companies. This would be bad. And so they gutted it. So now we have medical marijuana. <coughs> and it's a little bit better than it was in the beginning. But it's really expensive. A lot of people just go out of state. And it's, you have to qualify as conditions. But you can actually qualify. I've been told kind of easy so it just depends what access you have mm -hmm. to healthcare. um i wish honestly it's i i can't really do it because i can't inhale <laughs> i can't i'm like bill fucking clinton <laughs> i didn't inhale because i can't it burns but what i've had has really helped with my anxiety i think it's better than a lot of anxiety meds and probably safer how else Will they expand their win? Yeah, they have to. Um, let's see. Mormonism, the ultimate MLM. Yeah, I think that's why MLMs do so well here. And actually, because also, like, what do missionaries do all day? They sell. 
They sell all day long, every day. They're selling. They're selling their religion. So a lot of companies, including the company I used to work for, which was a big Fortune 500 company, they want to hire missionaries because they know if if you're in sales and you are a missionary, you're probably going to be pretty good because you got a lot of doors slammed in your face. So, yeah. <laughs> Sand Willow, I, I kind of agree. I kind of think we're on the same page on that. Yeah. Let's see. Harley, I wish you could like post a picture of your dingo. And Ogden, man. So Ogden's about an hour north of Salt Lake. Um, Just got convicted for assaulting his son for refusing to go on a mission. That doesn't surprise me. Probably friends with fucking Lori and Chud. <laughs> that is by where they would go to those like weird Zion camps. Like Ogden? close. No, Morgan is where they all are. They tend to be up in Morgan. And I don't know why. Isn't Morgan just kind of by Brigham City? No, Morgan's off 84. Okay, so 89. I would drive so, by it. So if you're going to South Ogden, you mm -hmm. take 84 and head back towards I-80. Just like when I'm going to Washington. Nope. Other part of 84. <laughs> I've lived here my whole life. And I'm so, yeah. just a lonely old truck driver. She was a truck driver. That's why she knows. Um Maybe repay with food or something. Younger ones should pay for their mission. And it's it, it is. I could not believe it. I didn't even know that missionaries paid for their missions until my friend's daughter went. And I was like, oh, well, that'll be fun. She gets to go to Ukraine. And she's like, it's expensive. And I said, what do you mean? And she goes, well, because we have to pay for it. And I'm like, what? She's like, well, it's a sliding scale. I'm like, oh, that makes it better. Yeah. Drove cross country a while back. Purple conundrum says need to stop in Salt Lake and in the bathroom <laughs> when he's a whole stack of Mormon pamphlets. Yep. <laughs> All over the place, especially if you were downtown. Come tour the temple, which is gorgeous, but not right now because it's under construction. And so it's just all scaffolding. So, yeah, it's not a good time. I'm trying to put the trumpet back on. I don't know if they'll do that because then your temples, they don't have Moronis on them. Some of them. They've been taking Moroni off. Mm. Probably because that was weird. If you don't know. <laughs> um, and it actually, on the Salt Lake Temple, it was used to call the Angel Gabriel was on temples. And then it changed to Moroni or it was both or something. But I think it was Gabriel. Maybe that was the South Jordan Temple. Oh, well, Gabriel. But anyway, so there's this thing <laughs> in Mormonism. I'm not making this up. That when the second coming happens, when the call out happens, which is a thing, that all the Moronis on the temple with the horns will sound their horns and it'll all be like really loud. And then we'll be like, oh, my gosh, Jesus is here. I, I believed that. And it may happen, except he fell off the temple and he shattered his horn. Um, let's see. Yeah. So, let's see. Stop me if you see one because, you know, I can't see anymore. And you know how fast you, you scroll, so I can't see anything. Oh, sorry. I do scroll kind of fast because I start to feel like nervous because I'm like, oh, I want to answer questions. But I also don't want this to be four hours like our last one. <laughs> okay. So Gail said, my daughter had a baby out of wedlock. She unexpectedly passed away 48 hours later. Oh, my God. The bishop came to my home and told me I need to put the baby up for adoption in a good Mormon home. Yeah. That is another issue I have with the church is that when unintended pregnancies happen, uh, they are highly encouraged to give the child up for adoption to a temple-worthy Mormon couple and if that is what you want to do, I support that. But you can't, you can't put that on someone. You know, it has to be their decision. And um, yeah, that's disgusting that that bishop did that and so inappropriate. But it's not shocking. Um, 
<clears throat> Let's see. And that's horrible. I'm so sorry about that. Um, Brandon was sucking down a monster drink when I met him when he came down to Louisiana. I remember thinking, hmm. Then I saw all the detectives doing the same. Then they all grew facial hair confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, for some reason, like those, which those aren't necessarily safe, those monster drinks and stuff, like people have died from like palpitation or like arrhythmias and stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are fine. Those are totally fine. We have, we have for Dr. Pepper. We have for, you know, it can be addicted to everything. But I wonder like what the other uh, <laughs> rehab patients thought. They were like all coming down from opioids or something. And this girl's like, but Dr. Pepper is really, <laughs> really bad. It, it, I mean, if I don't have a Diet Coke, I have a hard time. So I have no room to talk, but I'm just. Dr. Pepper. I gross. invented a scenario in my head that probably was offensive to someone, and I apologize. Are the men expected to be modest, too? <laughs> um, well, Donna Marie King. <laughs> yes, but, like, they don't ever say what. Um, I know short hair like they're not really supposed to have long hair now people have changed that now they have the whole stupid ass man bun thing i'm sorry i'm not a fan um so and there are a lot of kids that wear the man bun thing uh can't wait for that to go away but you know to uh a lot of like you have to wear shirt um i know it was kind of funny because some kids in like utah county which is where byu is which is super mo they were protesting. I thought this was super cool. Um, the school dress code went like was totally strict for girls and a bunch of girls were getting in trouble because it was basically like a Mormon dress code. And the boys got together and they all wore short shorts and teeny tiny tank tops and went to school because they knew it didn't apply to them. And they were they made a point. They were like, what? We're wearing the same thing as girls. Why aren't we getting in trouble? Well, because there wasn't a rule for that. And I have such an issue with like shaming people because of modesty. I think it's so ridiculous. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. Gail, you do not have to apologize for being angry because that's a totally valid feeling, valid emotion. Yeah totally valid and you were indoctrinated and, you, and I go through periods where I'm angry and then I go through periods where I'm like whatever and then go through periods where I get on YouTube and just offend people <laughs> um men do what they want dress as they like and act however women must be invisible in every sense so ridiculous yep I I feel like in certain circles, like a lot of my friends that are more progressive, it's not like that so much. But definitely, if you listen to these talks on Difficult Research's channel, and you think about like what they're saying, it's definitely men. I mean, Jason Mao is just, he's an ass. Like, Think about him and like I was listening to him talk and he's so sexist and homophobic, but so clearly sexist. Like we got to treat our, we got to make sure our boys act like men. And it's like, whatever, you're so gay. I mean, I don't know that, but you know, he's super homophobic. So probably, um, let's see. Why in rules? Yeah. If I missed someone, I'm sorry. I'm just looking. The transformed wife. I have heard of her. She seems quite problematic. Yeah. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Tina Reddington said, well, we weren't at church. We were camping. I think. Yeah. Um, my dad had a joke 
and he would always say it because there's like this story. I don't know if it's a Bible story or a Book of Mormon story. I think it's Bible. Um, like if we wanted to do something on Sunday, he'd be like, oh, the ox is in the mire. Because <laughs> I guess there was a Sunday and the ox was in the mire. And and so it was okay to do stuff. Um, what exactly does that mean? The ox is in the mire? Yep. Like the ox is stuck. And if the ox is stuck, you got to get the ox unstuck. What's the mire? Like, I don't know, quicksand. <laughs> I don't know. You shouldn't say something you don't know. Well, I'm pretty... Um, Google it. You tell me to Google stuff all the time. And then I do. And you're like, it doesn't matter. Um, so let's see. Nothing Lori prophesied it wasn't also plagiarized. So there's that. That's so true. Yeah, that's that's what I don't understand. I don't understand why more members or even ex-members aren't like, yeah, this is totally Mormonism. Like, how are people not talking about it? It's so obvious. It's so obvious. And it's just, it's shocking to me that, um, yeah. Exactly. Like, it's just Robbie just said. The story is not new. It's different names. It, it's not. I'm a non-Mormon child of the 80s and was raised the same way as far as expectations for female. And that, yeah, I mean, it's definitely not just Mormonism. I think my big complaint with Mormonism is when you claim to be the one true church, you claim to be, you know, the elect and the 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 shit you claim to be the shit um i don't think that you know i think it's hypocritical and also like the whole changing thing all the time oh i'm just clicking on shit now um well when it was a song too my dad worked at the state mental health hospital in provo he dealt with the oh yeah, Brian David Mitchell, who mm -hmm. pretended he was crazy. He threw pancakes at your dad. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. What about the... I heard that the the incident that happened at KSL. I heard that she's really nice. Probably. Because she got her anger out at KSL. Yeah. Um, Like... Yeah, let's see. Why don't the... There... Um, why don't you think Tylee spoke up when, when they questioned after Charles got killed? I think she was really scared. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that, uh, I want to like give it away because I've talked about it before, but I had one crazy parent and one normal parent and there is this weird sense of loyalty sometimes that you have to the crazy parent and especially where that's your birth parent. And you want to I think them. in some way, Tylee mothered Lori because you see it in the interviews um, in January where she's like, calm down. Like she's kind of trying to calm her mom down and, and she can tell her mom does not sound normal. Um, and I think maybe some of that was JJ um, or everything getting effed up again. Uh, but I think, you know, even when your mom is crazy, you still have that bond with her in some way. And so I think that, but I also, I, I think Tylee very well could have been threatened. Um, and I think it's like, I just thought of this recently. I think that was part of the reason why she wouldn't let JJ go to Charles funeral, because I think the kids probably heard something. I mean, I just don't imagine, like, that crew being able to plan something super secretive. Like, that's already hard if you're Mormon. Like, I'm sure that some, Tylee knew something, but also that she was scared. And scared for JJ because, you know, what happens if she speaks up? Well, then her mom gets arrested. Well, then what does she do? She can't. She doesn't have Charles. She doesn't have her mom. Um, and then what happens with JJ? 
Like, did, she loses JJ. Yeah, where would Tylee go? I I don't know. Yeah. I mean, maybe she could have gone, but I feel like she was really dependent. I independent, and I feel like she was ready to be an adult too. But I think there was probably some of that, like, and wanting to save JJ from her because I remember being, even though I fought with my siblings like crazy. I was protective of them. And there were times when things got really scary at our house. And I was like, I have to get home first because I have to be in the door first and make sure everything is safe for them. You know, and I was the one that took took the hits. I was the barrier, the what do they call it? Punching bag. <laughs> yeah, I was punching bag. <laughs> I, was the, I know it's not it's not good to joke about your childhood like that. But I was uh, the buffer. I was the buffer is what my therapist says. So it could have been that. Like she just took everything on. Um, I heard a podcast with an anonymous woman who said the inner circle was becoming worried about Chad and Laurie's behavior. Uh, maybe at the very end, my, my issue is that there was time and there were warning signs before then where Melanie Gibb and Zulema could have spoken up and more people could have spoken up. I mean, when I, but it just goes to show how indoctrinated these people were and how so many of them have received their second comforters. Cause like, it wasn't just Lori that saw Jesus Christ. Lori got that idea because of Denver snuffer and Denver snuffer got that idea because it's in Mormon teachings. And it's just that over the years, they've kind of gone like, we can't really talk about it anymore. But these people went to President Benson and they went to earlier prophets and those prophets had no problem with it. So I think maybe towards the end, but I think that there was plenty of time for them to do the right thing. And I don't think they did, but we don't, maybe we'll find out at the trial in a transcript. Um, <laughs> force me, I know. Yeah, Robbie, and I completely agree with you. Like, I do not have a problem I with people practicing their religion as they see it, voting as they see it. I don't have a problem at all. But when it's problematic and when people refuse to acknowledge that it's problematic and when people get murdered and hurt... I'm not cool with that. Um, yeah, and be, I like I just said, I don't think Christian values are bad. Um, I, I think that it, we could just call them values because I feel like a lot of times people like me that are agnostic or an atheist, you know, you hear Christian values and it's like, I think I have pretty decent values and I'm not Christian, but I get where you're going with that. And it's true. There people are evil in every religion, but this case isn't about every religion. This case is about people that were Mormon and the Mormon religion is very secretive and people are very curious about it and they want to understand, or at least try to understand what's going on. And there's been so much secrecy and so much um, lying on behalf of the church that I think it's important that people know what the truth is. I don't want to see another Charles or another Tylee or another JJ or another Tammy or another Joe. I don't really cover Joe because that's, I don't feel like that's as related to the church. Um, even though his lawyer did say Lori was looking crazy back then too. Um, Mormon's calling. Oh, this is just a, okay. So I think we'll go because we're at two hours and fifteen. So I didn't get to everything, but if you did have a question or a I'll comment, I'll try and answer it with Kathy. Oh, happy birthday, Gail. Yes, thank you. All right, <clears throat> thanks you guys for being here. I don't know if that helped. I just wanted to do a video that wasn't about getting hacked or being stalked. Um, but Joan, I haven't heard anything 
as far as I know, they still believe their dad. I think there's one or two of them that is having doubts, though. If you look at that interview, you'll see the Leah young, and the youngest the, one. The younger ones in the back. No, he was like here. He was like the young one, and then Leah, and you'll. Well, Garth and Emma were the two in the front, and then the well, three were in the back. They were giving their siblings death stares. Yeah, they're like, "Don't you even?" Yeah, I mean, if you look closely, because mm -hmm. I rewinded it like three times, I was like, "What?" And you yeah. see when they said, "Did like your dad do it?" You see the two of them go. Yeah. And then they looked at the two scary the, ones. The older ones. And they're like, no, 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 no. You know, I'm sorry. Emma looks kind of scary to me. I, I don't know. Anyway, thanks again. Um, I appreciate you all being here and hanging out with us on this family home evening. And I hope you enjoyed it. And we're going to try and do it as many Mondays as we can. And I am going to try and get something out, probably pre-recorded live um, the by the weekend if I can. I'm not going to promise anything, but I do have something that I want to get out. Oh, someone did ask, do you think Judge Boyce's decision to suppress documents and now to ban cameras are influenced by the church trying to distance themselves from the case? I'm not sure. I think there's a lot of issues with the mental health diagnosis. And that's a concern that I have because I think that that could very well be something that causes issues in the future. Um, I also don't think they have a diagnosis, honestly. I mean, it, uh, Wanda Barzi, it took them quite a while to figure out her diagnosis. Um, and I'm not a fan of releasing medical records just because of the precedent it sets and what's going on with like medical ethics right now. So that kind of stuff, I think, is more like HIPAA related because HIPAA is one of those laws that people actually don't try to get around um, as far as other documents and cameras. I think that it could be Lori's behavior because uh, she's not, she, she, some, mm -mm, she's, that, that skipper ponytail is too tight. Something's, but I, but I also think because this is such a high profile case, it would be too much of a circus. I do think some of that, cause I, I think that like we've seen in the true crime community, everyone's like, I'm going to go to the trial. I'm going to go. To the, and that's great. If you want to go, that's totally, if you want to go, but it's like, I don't know if you're going to get in and sit in the first row <laughs> or even get in the building. And I just think there's so much, even security-wise, too, because Lori is wearing a vest, you know, clearly. Like, they've had to shut down facilities and things like that because of threats. So it could be that. But, um, but I think if you want to go to the trial, you know, that's fine. But go because you want to support the family of the victims, not because of like status, like, oh, I went. Yeah. I went to this trial, people. Look but nobody me. in my chat would be like that. No, but I'm just saying there are people. All of my subscribers are amazing. Yeah. No, I'm just saying there are people out there in general that just want to go so they can say they went and they saw. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, yeah, being family Just is support the family of the victims. Yeah, and we do that on, on yeah. this channel. Um, but yeah, I I think there's that definitely there's going to be documents and there is going to be testimony and there are going to be a lot of things that do not look good for the Mormon church. So I have no doubt because someone was like, no, I think this is Mormon church. I'm like, I have no doubt that they're influencing it. I have no doubt that there are documents that the church doesn't want people to see like that. I have no doubt about that. But I think as far as like the cameras and maybe the medical information that that's more because to protect the case, not necessarily to be less transparent, but I'm of course not judge Boyce. So I'm also not an attorney. I've never been in the courtroom except for a divorce. Um, yeah, 
I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I definitely think Christian and I would say even other members of the family. um, Yeah, I think it's it's kind of hard because I'll trying to think of how to say this without um, it's it can be kind of hard I think like as a friend that sometimes she goes into a chat or she is on her live and everybody wants to know about her parents which is fine they're the public face of the case and of course we are all concerned about them because they're family and they're the grandparents and totally respect that. And I totally don't think anybody should like not be asking, but a lot of times I'll hear somebody skip right over her. So like, they don't even ask her how she's doing. And I'm kind of like, maybe ask her how she's doing. She, you know, started this platform for a reason and she's doing amazing with it. And I'm super proud of her. So maybe ask her how she's doing um, and ask her how her parents are doing and ask her how the rest of her family is doing. But I do feel sometimes like that does happen. And I know that she is um, working. Krisha Joan is actually JJ's aunt, Tylee's cousin and Charles niece. She's the daughter of Kay and Larry. Um, so she's the biological aunt of JJ. Um, she has worked very, very hard on her platform and she wants to spread awareness. And that's how we like kind of hooked up, um, not hooked up, but became friends. So, uh, I think she needs to fill the support and be supported. And I'm telling you, if you haven't subscribed, if you haven't gone to her channel, if you want to understand more, you have to, you need to go over there because what I like is that she has these talks and you can just listen to them and be like, yeah, this is what they said rather than my dumbass interpreting them for you. So, yeah. They all need support. No. No, JJ's um bio mom is no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, oh, which is too bad. Everything. It's uh, really sad. Um, and then, yeah. You're still wrong? What am I wrong about? Or, oh. Okay, I see. I see what's going on. Okay. We're having a spat. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um. Again, thanks, and we will see you next Monday together. Type in the chat if you want to ta- us to talk about anything. This is going to be a laid-back format. Like, not super. This is probably a little too informative. We didn't get to, you know, I want to do more interactive interaction stuff. And then I will see you hopefully later this week in a pre-recorded video. And thank you for all of your support. You guys are all amazing. And all of your comments, even if I haven't commented back or let you know that I like them, you guys are truly, truly amazing and supportive. And I love all of you. So remember who you are and what you stand for. And we'll see you later.